showing up here for work every day with the mountain views and the multiple fields and the facility, that's kind of the most pinch me part about, about sure. being here. Between the five of us, we make a pretty good coach. And it's an awesome way to look at it because the cool thing is when you're a college coach, you're on an island, you're by yourself. Yeah. A few short hours on the plane only piqued my excitement to spend a day in Goodyear, Arizona at the home of the Cleveland Indians and their spring training complex to learn from one of the best young infield coaches in the country and a loyal ABCA member. We're connecting with lower level infield coordinator Kainoa Correa to break down his journey in baseball plus take it to the backfields and break down his philosophies on infield play. This episode is presented by Baseball Coaches Insider, the exclusive provider of the ABCA Barnstormer Clinic video series. We can't thank them enough for their efforts in bringing this project to life, working the cameras to help us take a deeper dive into these programs and these coaches. And we hope that you go check out more of their exceptional resources at coachesinsider.com. We finally get a chance to sit down and catch up a little bit and talk through some stuff. I think it's, again, walking this facility, Kai, this has got to be a dream come true, right? Yeah, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. Ridiculous. I think of all the parts about the job, I think showing up here for work every day with the mountain views and the multiple oh. fields and the facility, that's kind of the most pinch me part about, about sure. being here. That's outstanding. I wanted to, for our guys, take us back through your history in baseball. It's such a unique story. Can you open that up a little yeah, bit? Yeah, absolutely. So born and raised in Hilo, Hawaii, mm -hmm. uh, grandson of a, of a legendary high school coach who coached um, all the way um, after serving in World War II. Wow. Um, all, all the way to 2014, into wow. his mid 90s before he passed. So he coached over 60 years, um, and he actually won the last territorial championship before we transitioned to statehood. Wow! So that kind of gives you a cool. marker of his career. And so um, then my father was a high school coach after him. Yep. And and then that's kind of that that family that I grew up in, where baseball was a topic at the dinner table and at Thanksgiving, and it's important. And so my after school care became their practices. And so. That's kind of where I started. Um, I went off and played Division Three baseball at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. And then I fortunately got the opportunity to go to Northern Colorado, uh, be the volunteer for a season, and then uh, the, the paid guy for, for three. Sure. And so that kind of leads us all the way up un until joining the Indians. And every year, I think the pivotal moment I go back on is after my first season at Puget Sound, when I'm 22 years old and a first year coach, mm -hmm. I sat down and I restructured my infield program going into year two. The things I didn't like, the things I wanted to do better, sure. the feedback from the guys, the on-field results, and that became tradition. That is grooming you for a long-term yeah, yeah, success yeah. in this game. Absolutely. Um, another point that comes up, you know, we're sitting here at the Cleveland Indians facility, Kai, and, and you're wearing an Indians jersey. Yeah. And you were a average Division three baseball player. Yeah. Explain that dynamic, because I think um, again, a guy that played Division Two wasn't very good. When you think about your transition, uh, sometimes that seems way too far off. That reality sinks in that, number one, I'm not getting drafted. I'll never have pro ball on my resume. How have you really counteracted that? Major League Baseball is El Dorado. Yes. Right? It's the Golden City. Yeah. And so if you want to go to the El Dorado, it makes sense that you surround young guys with guys who've been to El Dorado. That's right. Hey, tell me about how clean the streets are. Tell makes me how much sense. gold there is and the jewelry and the spoils. That's so those stories and their 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 little anecdotes are mm -hmm. what help guide a young guy to that city. That's right. Right. But as player development has evolved and as organizations have become forward thinking, they've realized that they needed a merger of the content and the numbers and the science. Sure. Right. And those stories. Both are incredibly valuable. So those guys collectively um, were really, really experienced and good at navigating that journey to El Dorado, yeah. right? And having those one-on-one -on -one interactions and putting their arm around a guy or kicking a guy in the butt and providing small anecdotes and small details. And my role was to add and assist in kind of programmatic, systematic development programs for the youngest guys, the guys who are most comparable in age to That's the right. levels I've coached at to get a, establish good routines. And so Travis Fryman has a, a saying, he always says, he says it, once every three infield meetings, he says, hey, between the five of us, we make a pretty good coach. And that's an awesome way to look at wow. it. Because the cool thing is when you're a college coach, you're on an island, you're by yourself. Yeah. You, 
you are responsible, whether it's the hitters, the pitchers, the catchers, the infielders, that's your thing. Discuss your growth as an infield coach, as an infield teacher, because that's where I see you in this space and and being at the forefront of, of infield coaches around yeah. the country. I firmly believe that. When I see you, I, I know in your heart of hearts, it is in a, you're in a constant state of challenging where you're at. And that only started with that first habit of really evaluating. Yeah. Can you discuss that growth that brings yeah. us to here? I think that growth can be summed up into a simple thing. It's using hard data, yeah. whether that's film or analytics, raw numbers to provide more options, mm. right? So mm. harsh information to softer, more flexible style of teaching. Gotcha. Right? Those are the two things. The more I got more content, the more I watched film, the more I ran the numbers, the more you saw variety. So to achieve that variety, you have to teach more options. Eventually, you're going to see a major league player do something contradictory to what you believe. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys will say it's because he's a big leaguer, right. so he can do that. Boys and girls, you don't do that. Right. That's a that's a cop out to me. Yeah. Right. Instead, I, I decided let's dig more. If I can find one guy doing this, I've got to be able to find 20 guys doing this. I've got to find 20 guys doing this 20 times. Then once I find 20 guys doing this 20 times, what are the commonalities with that move? So now that's no longer uh, a strange outlier. Yeah. That's a technique that can be added, right? And so I think my expansion as a coach, my growth as a coach has by come by adding different golf clubs every year. That's right. I still got the same driver. I got still got the same putter, but we filled in a lot of the gaps, mm. right? And that's kind of, and we filled it in with hard data. I and, love it. And so that's kind of my, my thought process and how this development has happened. So when we get into infield play, mm -hmm. I'd love to get you on the field and talk yeah, through some yeah, stuff. Yeah, absolutely. We got all these fields right here. You mm -hmm. want to head down and do that? Yeah, let's do it. Let's knock it out. Now we're upstairs talking about variability and we're talking about having options for infielders. And let's start on the very micro side of this. So in terms of us walking out to practice and things we work with our guys on the micro side, what are you going to offer? One thing that nearly every infield coach in the country does yeah. is some type of pick work. Right. Some type of short hop work, whether it's stationary, standing, or kneeling. Right. So at, when I was growing up as a kid, um, when I was growing up as a kid, everybody did some kind of kneeling glove work. Sure. Right. And you had two schools of thought in infield. You had the school of thought that you were going to press through as many things as you could, right? Or you were going to funnel to soften the ball. One or the other. Yeah. And coaches believed one or the other and didn't believe in the opposite. That's right. What I slowly learned to believe is that you do both, right? There are plays that you have to press through and there are mm -hmm. plays that you have to funnel. There are plays you have to go one-handed, there are plays you have to go two-handed. So the idea would be integrating that into your pick series. So the first thing I do when I alter my pick work is I create a constraint, right? So I want to create a physical barrier that puts a guy in good posture. Eight to 10 inches out in front of the fielder's knees, and I say, hey, everything we do, whether we're moving forward or backward, it has to be fielded in front of gotcha. them. So that constraint is gonna correct posture. Mm -hmm. So now, if I'm upright, or I'm lazy, or if I'm slouched, or if I have a curve in my back, I really have to extend my hand forward to make a catch, which is gonna feel uncomfortable. Right. So what I learned to do is I learned to get that shoulder tilt forward. Right? So when I have good shoulder tilt, my shoulders will take me right in front of this line, and now I very easily can pre present in front of it. So we're always going to go up off our feet, Gotcha. Right? have our butt a little bit pointed backwards, have our shoulders tilted forward, and have a flat back. Gotcha. Right? So one great way to start um, kneeling work is to go barehanded. Okay. Right? The, uh, I, I love valley training gloves, but barehanded is the, uh, it's the best, most affordable training glove there is in the market. No doubt. Right? One of the reasons I like barehanded is because every move is intensified. Okay. Right? So if I'm a flat presenter, it's very obvious. There's no shot I can field it. Right? right. When I'm an open presenter, I'm showing the amount of surface area necessary to catch the approaching ball. Sure. Right? So we're simply going to start with, we're going to start with short hops and we're just going to go to the catch. Gotcha. So I'll explain as we go. So a couple things you're going to notice. I want the swing to be as subtle as possible. Hey, you're very loose, very relaxed. Yeah. So Instead of going a one uniform swing like that, yep. which a lot of guys do in their pick drills, mm -hmm. that's extreme. And why this is extreme is that I'm creating a lot of direction that way that's unnecessary. And also, the farther I take the ball away from me, the longer it's got to come back to eventually exchange it. Absolutely. So if I can go soft and subtle, I can become more repeatable and I have a better chance of capturing the ball. A couple other keys here. Watch my head. I'm going to bury my chin on glove contact. Absolutely. That's going to keep me stacked. If I don't bury my chin, I have a chance to come out of posture. Right. But by burying my chin, I keep that shoulder tilt and hip hinge the same. 
right? So just that simple move open. The last thing is there's no closure of the hinge. So I don't do this, mm -hmm. right? I'm not gonna allow that ball to ride up. Once I make that stop, that my palm is still open and facing the direction in which the ball came. Right, so we went purely to the catch. Mm -hmm. Now we'll go to the center or the separation, right? So center and separation is something that's important to me because that establishes a consistent exchange point. And by right. establishing a consistent exchange point, that means my arm swing is gonna take the same amount of time and it's gonna make it easier for me to sink my feet yep. and my hands up. If I allow where I catch the ball to dictate where I exchange it, then I'm adding another variable into the equation and it's gonna be hard for me to sink my feet Absolutely. up. Absolutely. Right? If I catch one off right of center, it's gonna be quicker, right? And then my arm's gonna be early. If I catch one far off on this side and I have to let my feet travel, then my arm's gonna be late but I'm just going straight to that center point. And when I get to center, it's thumb to thumb, right? It's thumb to thumb, right? Because it's gonna create an option for me to take it out. Gotcha. So short hop to center, right? So now we're at one hop type and a second move. Now we're gonna add a second hop type. He's gonna start rolling the ball. Okay. On a rolling ball, go ahead, roll it. I'm not worried about shortening that hop, right? Okay. I don't need to press through it to contain it. I don't need to press through it to increase my catch rate. Right. So my thought process there is I can start to merge those two acts together. Gotcha. Now funneling has a really bad reputation for guys who teach pressing because they think about it as letting the ball get way too deep. Absolutely. Affecting posture. But by building in this constraint, I can police that when I funnel and when I press, I still catch the ball in the same spot. That's it. Out in front of the window. That's it. Right. So if I were to freeze at a funnel, and I were to freeze at a press on a short up, that catch point is gonna be the same spot. Right. Right. So the reason why the coaches who didn't like funneling for its negative action yep. can be erased. From there, we're talking about exchange, right? So if I can establish a uniform exchange point, then I have a, just a really simple move. Sure. To get to the throwing position, the power position or separation. Right, so I just gotta take it out right from the center, thumb to thumb, thumb to thumb, and just pull that bow back and I'm there. Got a nice little tight infield arm circle. Yep. So now we're gonna go two hop types all the way to the throwing position. Gotcha. So a couple keys here is I'm using my eyes to pick up my eventual target, mm -hmm. just, but I'm keeping my shoulder tilt the same. I'm still establishing the same center and the same catch point and I'm reacting based on that. Now I'm gonna introduce a third hop type. Okay. That little high hop, that top shelf hop, that ball that bounces up above your waist. So you gotta go from fingers down to fingers, fingers up. up mm -hmm. right? But it still should be the same style of catch, the same style of exchange. Now this is unique, right? Because I'm not, not, not necessarily gonna to have to push this one forward. Right. right? But I don't necessarily wanna get, get too far back. So I'm catching it somewhere in between, still out in front of this line, mm -hmm. right? If it's inside of my shoulders and my hips, I'm gonna use two hands for it. Okay. just like I would that rolling ball. If it's outside my shoulders and the hips, I'm gonna use one hand for it because it's faster and more efficient. It's mm -hmm. a safer way to secure the catch. Sure. So you're gonna go short hop, rolling ball, high hop in a row, all the way to the power position. Okay, here we go. But I'm reacting, right? So I'm starting down in that same presented spot every time and then I see it up and then I go. Some of them are one-handed plays, some of them are two-handed. Some of them are more forward than others, some of them are more backward than sure. others. But I'm still making that same decision. I'm still burning my eyes in the leather and I'm still maintaining posture the whole time. Now taking this one step forward, this isn't gonna happen sequentially in the game. Sure. So he's been going sequentially, so what we're gonna do is just mix it up. Sometimes he's gonna give me short, sometimes he's gonna give me a rolling ball, sometimes he's gonna give me a top shelf. I have to react. I love it. Now can we move into, again, that's a micro side of things. That's a, a, a short option based prescription drill for infielders. Now we're gonna think macro here because mm -hmm. there's a there's a transition from us living here inside this drill series mm -hmm. to now getting in the game. And I know in our talks we talked about the fact that you know a lot of coaches just bear down on some of the the basic things an infield play that, that every infield coach would know. But we're not talking situational awareness. We're not talking what really shows up in the game. Yes. So in in one sense if you think about this, this is a series of decision making. You're allowing the Absolutely. hop to decide whether you go forward or backward, yep. use one hand or two hands. The game is just an expansion of that. Yeah. That's also a series of decisions. Do I put it in my pocket or do I make the throw? Do I jump throw to second or do I set my feet and throw to first? Sure. 
that's determined by the score, the out, the inning, the speed of the runner, and all those dynamics involved. So there are fun ways that you can transition from a drill like we just did into another stationary drill by incorporating different types of balls that represent different runner speeds or different directions to start triggering those decisions. Break it down for us. All right, so in, in talking about ways where we can expand on that style of decision making, yep. uh, one of my favorite things to do is incorporate different balls. Okay. So why I like different balls is because they all react differently. They have different weights. Um, they have a different level of bounciness. And so they intensify the three hop types that we were talking about with the baseball. One thing you can do when you were asking questions about making decisions, sure. you know, like based on pace, um, is you can associate different things with the different balls. So in this case, um, we're going to go the different balls mean different runner speeds. Okay. So I've got three types of balls. We've got a wiffle ball, we've got a tennis ball, we've got a racquetball. You can do it with any type of ball or you can color baseballs, whatever you want to do it. Um, the, the wiffle ball in this case is going to be a slow runner. The, the tennis ball is going to be a uh, is going to be an average runner and the racquetball is going to be a fast runner okay right and so i'm going to do my footwork in terms of my post field movement uh, based on the runner speed i've evaluated so it's getting my mind, mind used to using my eyes to determine what pace i'm going to choose really speeding up the game in between their ears in right addition there. to that um he's still going to give me different hop types like i was when we were doing the stationary drills now to add a wrinkle to this Right, and to really trigger that post field move being a little bit more direction in terms of creating uh, distance and direction as Perry Hill would call it. I'm gonna just do a little rocker step. I'm gonna do a little toe up. Okay. So I'm gonna start in a stationary position. I'm gonna have my toe up. Now why is that? Just create a little rhythm in their feet? Or? Yeah, and so that way, as I make the move to field the ball, I'm gonna descend my toe. I'm gonna send weight into this left leg and that's gonna really trigger me to take my right to my left and my left to the right. Gotcha. When gotcha. I do a stationary drill, what happens a lot is your guys, as they do it over and over, the steps get smaller and smaller mm -hmm. and the move gets more and more upright. Right? And that's going to lead to some pretty bad habits. So this drill, in terms of triggering your toe up, is a really nice bridge from taking a guy stationary to on the move. Love it. So we're going to start in this stack position and we're going to start with the slow runner. Here we go. Right, so I see that it's a wiffle ball. Yep. I know that he's slow. I take my time. I can go four step alignment. I can tap, I can note tap, whatever you want to do. Okay, so now we'll go to an average runner with a tennis ball. I can do a sped up version of the two step or I can do a slow version of the one step. Again, one more. Right, simple as that. Right. And then the racquetball, that's gonna be the toughest one to catch in exchange. That's gonna be our fast runner. Right, so I really gotta get it and go. Here sure. we go. Just a little two-step pattern every time on the racquetball because I've established that he's fast. So you're going two-step, four-step? Is that your yeah. language? So four-step would be the slow guy every time. Yep. And then an aggressive four-step with an average runner on a ball that's well struck. Right. Or it's kind of looser two-step. And then a good runner is two-step every time. Gotcha. Now, a lot of guys ask me about this. Hey, does it make them slow? Hey, does it promote rhythm? Really, it's all about creating adjustability. That's it. So you decide based on your student, the level of player, the type of athlete he is. Is he a guy that needs to be sped up, mm -hmm. whether it's throwing, hitting, fielding, mm -hmm. tempo of practice, or is he a guy that needs to be slowed down? So now we're going to evolve this, and we're going to go random order. So I'm going to have to react with my eyes based on what ball he feeds me and make a determination from there. Here we go. Fast runner there. Slow runner right there. An average runner there, right? Yep. Evolving that, another step forward, is making decisions about direction. Okay. In the game, sometimes I gotta go to two, sometimes I gotta go to one, sometimes I gotta go to four. Right, so the ideal flexible scenario Right, the most flexible scenario that I like to put an infielder in in this type of drill is first and third playing halfway. Okay. Okay, so first and third, and we're playing halfway. So when we're in first and third and playing halfway, if I get a ball that's hard hit, double play, I'm probably going two. Yep. Right, turn two, get out of it. We've made yep. that determination. If we wanted to go one on everything, we would have played all the way in. That's it. Okay, if the ball is hit without pace, Right, so it's chop or slow. Now I'm either going to go there or reading whether he that's was on it. a contact play. No doubt. So that's why I call it the most flexible position an infielder gets in because that's one of the only times that he could go one of three spots. Mm -hmm. The racquetball is going to be home, 
Okay. Tennis ball is going to be two. Wiffle ball is going to be one. Gotcha. So now I'm going to make a determination with my eyes based on which ball he rows me, which direction I'm going to go. All right, here we go. That's great. So now we got variability inside the actual balls we're using. Again, create a drill that gives us these game situational awareness. Do I use one hand or do I use two hands? Yeah. Do I go forward or do I go backward? Do I go fast or do I go slow? Yep. Do I go to home or first or second? Now I'm creating a physically versatile infielder who can do all those directions and those tasks and a mentally agile infielder it is. who can make the decision between the three. Wow. Now, fun alterations. So different, some people don't like balls. They'd rather do baseballs because we play with baseballs. I understand that argument. Sure. Take your baseballs, mark them with different colors. There you but go. But if you don't want to do that, some people are like, hey, we're going to make this decision based on what we hear. 1-1-1 one, one, one from the catcher, 2-2-2. Two, two, two. Now, I know being here at Cleveland, you're privy to a lot more numbers, data, analytical stuff yeah. than we would if we were college coaches or high school coaches. And I know in really you studying exactly what your guys see in game, yeah. that's really helped maybe change the way that we think about hitting fungos to guys. Maybe yeah, we transition these guys in terms of the type of ground ball. Yeah, let, we'll walk over there, hit some ground balls, and we'll talk about the numbers that each guy get and how we can replicate them. Let's do it. When we were talking out there, we were talking about um, making fungos more game-like, sure. using data and incorporating information. Right. Right. So we're going to start just by hitting some ground balls at third base. So we'll just hit the run-of-the-mill ground balls that we see most college coaches hit or yep. amateur coaches hit. So just nice little backspin ground balls, two to three hops. Go ahead, Sheets, hit, yep. hit a regular ground ball. Right. So that's the really common ground ball we'll see. Right. Not necessarily a high degree of difficulty, right. not necessarily a huge discrepancy. In regard to the uh, in regard to the spin and the pace, right? So if you had to guess, would you have any idea what an average major league ground ball is in terms of speed? Exit velo. Exit velo. Mm -hmm. Man, we got to live on a hard ground ball average. I'm thinking we're 85 to 70 to 80, maybe okay. somewhere in there. So most major league ground balls live somewhere in the upper 70s and low 80s. Okay. Right? To the corner infielder, starting to a third baseman, your average ground ball um, is 81, 80 miles per hour. Gotcha. Right? Okay. So a little slower. Right? Another unique thing with a third baseman is that your average launch angle is steeper. It's a negative 18. Right. Right? So that initial hop, it's going to be inside of 20 feet. It's going to be inside of a third of the way to the mound. Wow. Okay. And then the last thing you need to know when you're hitting to a third baseman is that majority of the balls, over 88% are topspin. So although a backspin fungal might be aesthetic, sure, right? It might look good when I hit infield, outfield in front of the other team. That's right. It's unlike ground balls he gets in the game. It's unlike less than 12% of the ground balls he gets in the game. And in fact, over 88 are going to be really ugly. They're going to be hooked. They're going to be topspin. Right. Right. So one thing when we're manipulating ground balls, especially to the corner infielder, <clears throat> we're going to want to hit create some topspin. So we can throw, roll our wrists. Yep. We can throw that thing away. So go ahead, Sheetsy, mix okay. in some topspin ground balls. So that's pretty good. So now that's extreme, yeah. right? We got to figure we're going like negative 45 degrees there. So we try to go topspin and then a little further away. So see if we can do it. All right, that was weird spin. <laughs> go ahead. Okay. That's pretty good. Yep. Right. So we get the picture. Yes. And, no matter where you split it, when you look at the hard numbers, a backspin ground ball, a aesthetically pleasing backspin fungal is unrealistic. Just does not show up in a game. A third baseman, he's going to get over, over 80% of his ground balls for right-handed hitters. Sure. Right? The shortstop, he's going to get over 75% of ground balls from right-handed hitters. Right? The, the second baseman, he's going to get over 66% of his ground balls from a left-handed hitter. Sure. And the first baseman, he's going to get over 80% of his ground balls from a left-handed hitter. Right. Right? So the majority of ground balls we get are from the pool side infielder. Right? Makes They're, sense. So if you're a right-handed fungal hitter and you hit backspin ground balls to the first baseman, you're hitting him right-handed backspin ground balls, something he gets less than 5% of the time. Wow. So if he only takes ground balls from you for the whole season, yeah. he's preparing for 5% and not getting the other 95%.
then we got to flip that model and give him more top spin ground exactly. balls. Exactly. So now giving him more top spin ground balls gets you more like spin, but still doesn't match the handedness. Sure. It'd be like facing a right-handed BP thrower and hit, having a hit against 90% lefties in the game. Gotcha. All right, it's very contradictory. So what are ways we can fill that in, right? What are the ways we can make those balls more game-like, right? One of the ways, using other coaches, right? Okay. If we got a lefty outfield coach, lefty catch coach, whatever, on staff, left-handed pitching coach, getting them to hit fungos to the right side of the infield. That's it. Utilizing pitchers, right? So having a pitcher who's right and left-handed hit, hit to each side every day during BP. That's right? great. And then the third way, utilizing shapes, right? So I can go from here, I can go that way and hit across to the first baseman. Right. So it's more like lefty spin, so I can hit top spin from that angle and I can go that way and hit it into the four hole and create this, th these different directions and different spins. Sure. Then hit going straight on as a righty, right? I can do the same vice versa for the third baseman. All right, and then the last way you can create realistic shape for your ground balls is by using BP. Okay. And remembering that most teams go on a rotation, right? So it goes like defense to base running, base running to hitting. That's right. Hit, you know, to cage, cage to here. So every time somebody's on the field, a group's hitting. So you can sync that up. Mm -hmm. If you're starting second baseman and you're starting first baseman, are in groups, BP groups that are primarily right-handed, they're not gonna get a ton of balls off the bat. That's right. Right? So you wanna sync up lefties, whether they're left-handed outfielders, left-handed first baseman, whatever it may be, to and have them hit when that rotation is on defense. No doubt. Right, so they get those game-like reps. The same vice versa right right-handers. And that's all we're doing, that's all we're talking about is taking the data, taking what's being told to us with real data and saying, now how does this incorporate into our practice plan? How does this work within, again, the individual skill development of each of our players? How can I replicate what shows up in game? That's basically what it is. 100%. That's outstanding. Again, Kai, thanks for letting us hang out with you, man. This Absolutely. has been awesome. What a great opportunity. My pleasure. Thanks for being part of what we do. No problem. That first meeting, there's probably not a whole lot of conversation about baseball. Right. It's more about how the program's gonna function, how the organization's gonna function, how we wanna function inside of it.